Now, a little bit about the timetable here. It started in 74, and we captured our first image in December of 1975. The first image was kind of strange. Um, we had no way to look at partial images. The only thing you could look at for the year we spent building it was oscilloscope traces and voltage measurements. There was no way to look at anything. So finally, after we built the camera and the playback unit, I looked at Jim Schickler, the technician who was working with me, and, and I said, we've got to take a picture of something. And our lab was about as unphotogenic a place as you could imagine. So I walked down the hallway. I found a young lab technician. Her name was Joy Marshall. She was sitting at a teletype. And I asked her if I could take a head and shoulder shot of her, and I did. And uh, she knew us from the, down the hall. And so the camera started to record the image. I walked back to the lab, popped it out, put it in the playback unit, and up popped the image on the screen. And what it showed was her hair. You could see her hair. You could see the background. And her face was complete static, totally unrecognizable. And um, I was thrilled. And so was Jim. And I remember saying, so much is working. This is fantastic. This is great. And he said the same thing. Man, we knew a thousand reasons why you might not see anything. Now, Joy had followed us back into the lab, and she was less impressed with the image. Um, she said, needs work, turned around and walked out. Um, but I, had, I had reversed the order of the bits. When I designed the playback unit, I, I just reversed the order. So if it was all zeros or all ones, it was OK. But anything in between was sort of flipped. It took us about an hour to figure it out. And that's when we had our first image. Technical report was published, some of the pictures you've seen from here. It was in 1977. We applied for and was granted a patent for the first digital camera in 1978. And as President Jackson indicated, that was the only public disclosure of any of this work that took place. Uh, and any inquiries we got about this patent, I had to refer back to public relations. I couldn't respond at all. Uh, and then we started having internal demonstrations throughout the company uh, in 1976. Let me describe what they're, what they're like, because this was interesting. What would I do is I would uh, gather people in a conference room with a long table down the middle, and people would sit on either side. And I would bring my camera from my laboratory, which is just down the hall. I'd fold it up, say a little prayer, hope it worked, and then walk down. And I'd walk in the room, and I'd take a picture immediately of the person who was sitting on the right side, head and shoulder shot. And then while I was, uh, I would then describe what I had just done and what this thing was to cleverly hide the 23 seconds I needed in order to get the next picture. <laughs> And then I would walk to the other side, and I would grab a picture of that person, and then I would pop that uh, camera in the middle, pop the cassette out, give it to Jim, he'd put it up there on the playback unit, which we had moved into the conference room, and up would pop the picture. And uh, I don't think we ever finished the demonstration. I had a whole thing prepared, but the question started coming. And so I want to share with you some of the reaction that we had uh, to this. Um, First of all, we, the, we, we went and showed this to uh, a number of people. And in any organization, you show it to your boss. And then when he's comfortable with it, he shows it to his boss. And you work your way up. And we worked our way pretty high up the company. But we never got to the CEO or the head of the corporation, although they had heard about it. And they asked about it. And, uh, but they said, no, we really don't want to show it to you because it's not ready for prime time. Which, that is definitely true. I was a little disappointed, but I said, well, I understand that. When you think about it, you, here we were taking pictures without film and displaying them without printing on paper at Eastman Kodak Company. <laughs> Not a good way to get invited to the Christmas party, I guess. It, was, uh, it, was, it, was a, it created a lot more questions than answers. And I think that made people nervous. But uh, the concept really, when they viewed it, it, they viewed it as basically too far out there for serious consideration. What I mean by that is it wasn't just the fact that it didn't use film. It didn't use any of the existing infrastructure that we had in place for photographic world. It didn't have photo finishing. It didn't have printing. It didn't have anything. Photo albums. What, what, what is all that? Nothing was used. And so it was very disruptive in the sense that it didn't use any of the model that, that existed. And people weren't terribly disappointed with what we had at the time either. So they weren't looking for a change. They were quite convinced that people would not want to look at their tele pictures on television set. They were convinced that nobody would be happy unless they had a print in their hand. Now, I thought that was a little odd because we had a sizable business with slide projections. Um, but uh, they were convinced that that was the case, that that would not be uh, uh, very uh, acceptable to anybody. They were quite sure about that. And then tons of questions. Tons of questions about uh, what's an photo, electronic photo album going to look like. Remember, there's no personal computers. There's none of that around. Um, and then when are you going to get film quality up to, to film quality size, right? And then the big question I was asked all the time is, well, when would this be available to the consumer? 
Now, you know, when you're doing stuff like this as a technical person, you, you think they're going to ask you, well, how did you get this clever technical thing to work or that thing to work? Or, they didn't ask any of that. They asked me these questions. I hadn't thought about how, how do I know when it's going to be available? I don't know. But they kept asking me, so I used Moore's Law because it was a digital product. And I called the research labs and I said, okay, how many pixels would I need in order to make a reasonable consumer? I said, a reasonably acceptable, which means the lowest quality that can get away with. Uh, picture and they said, oh, that's easy, a million pixels, two million if you want color. So I said, okay, I've got 10,000 here to two million. I used Moore's Law of doubling and then uh, I, didn't, I had no idea if it applied to CCDs at all. Um, and I came up with between 15 and 20 years. And uh, that was a complete guess on my part and uh, you'll see later we introduced our first consumer camera 18 years later but I think that was just a combination of mistakes everywhere that just averaged out. Now, one thing I want to point out to you about this is that there's the technology, there's the concept that you're trying to get across, and then there's the technology you're using to demonstrate your concept. I used a completely digital system. This was completely digital, right from the output of the CCD right to the input pin to the television set. Um, but that was not a benefit. It might seem strange to you now, but digital was not the technology of uh, choice. It wasn't in vogue. It was considered very delicate, esoteric, expensive, unreliable, whatever you want to call it. There were no consumer products. Like today, you need digital on the title of anything you're selling in order to sell it. But back then, it was a detriment. So digital did not help me in this concept. It helped me demonstrate it. It worked. But it wasn't, in terms of moving forward, it wasn't very helpful. But I, I like to mention that to people because sometimes people look at this and say, wow, digital, of course you knew digital was coming. Digital did not help me in this presentation right there. And then the other aspect of this I think you have to take into account is the whole world's inventing along with you. I hadn't considered any of the uh, things you have up here. And I, and I think if you think about a digital camera, its utility would be not nearly as great if you didn't have these things. So the whole world infrastructure was changing. I hadn't considered that. And I had just considered it about in terms of taking pictures you know, without film. And so uh, this part of the discussion was really not taking place in 1976 when I was showing this. So there was this reaction to that as well, and that was uh, uh, certainly part of the, the, the pushback because they didn't see the world, nobody saw the world changing in so many ways over this period of time. Um, but in the 1980s, you saw uh, a, a development called Still Video Floppy. Some of you may remember it, but it was a, a small two-inch disc that rotated at 60 hertz, and it recorded basically a television signal, slightly modified for this application. And what you would do is capture a single image or a single field or two fields, and uh, you would then play it back on a special player on a television set. So it was NTSC resolution, uh, but it was quick, and several companies like Sony and Canon were, uh, were pushing this. And, I thought this was great for two reasons. One was it sort of woke the company up to new competitors. Our competitor before this was Fuji, Agfa. But all of a sudden, people like Sony and Canon were talking about making pictures. And so it woke the company up to starting to look at this. And so that created more energy around this. And we got more interest in pursuing this kind of activity. And the other one was it simply wasn't going to work. The NTSC, the restrictions on an NTSC encoded signal uh, are far uh, worse than anything photography could produce. And I think one of the things you have to realize in a displacement technology is that if you're going to have a displacement technology, you have to meet the existing technology in every attribute and then exceed it in at least one. You can't ex ask a public to accept something less on one aspect to get something better on the new one. And so uh, it wasn't going to be, uh, it wasn't going to be an easy acceptance, but it really started people thinking about it. And then um, in 1986, Kodak went public with some of their work. They introduced and demonstrated the first megapixel sensor. Why megapixel? Because we knew that the evolving electronic still imaging world was going to, we didn't know exactly where it was going to go, but we knew it was going to revolve around the computer and not the television set. And therefore, we didn't have resolution restrictions, which we wouldn't accept because we knew what good photography was and we knew what people would accept. <clears throat> so we introduced that to demonstrate that we were developing a capacity far beyond those of what other people were developing at the time because they were interested in just replacing Viticon tubes which had limited resolution. And then the first consumer camera was the Apple Quick Take. Why do I call it an Apple Quick Take? Because we could not market this camera. This camera was developed specifically for Apple because they requested it. We had the capability to do it, 
We designed and manufactured it, but we didn't have the capability to market it, simply because we didn't have the channels or the channels were unwilling to deal with this because you were dealing with the real conflict of existing film-based channels and this new electronic approach. <clears throat> I also am told by the, the developer of this that they had to make it look like a binocular instead of a regular camera. They did not want any confusion. So here we're in a difficult period uh, for, uh, for the development of uh, photography. Um, but then we did finally get, get a, I think it was a DC-40, it was about a year later. It was a little bit higher resolution. This was like 756 by 512, I think, and stored about eight images or so. Um, <clears throat> and then we started marketing cameras under our own name. And then I think starting in 1997 or so, compression appeared and then you had megapixel consumer cameras. And then I think the resolution of consumer cameras has increased by one million pixels per year since then. And so I think today now, I think you can buy consumer pocket cameras at about 14 megapixels. So, so um, I wanted to share with you just the history of that and how, it, how it's taken off since then. And um, I just wanted to share with you some observations um, because one of the interesting things about being on this journey is I had a really a front row seat to a major technological discontinuity and how it uh, affected an entire industry, a company, the people around me, people I work with. And, um, and I was lucky to be in some way involved with this over that whole period of time. And I learned a couple of things and I thought this would be a great opportunity to share some of this stuff. Uh, so, first realizing that most of us don't work in startup companies. We work in established organizations, organizations that are proud of what they do and probably aren't looking for something too dramatic a change. And uh, engineers basically, I think, are change agents. That's why you're here. You want to do something new. You want to do something great. Well, change, uh, engineers are usually at the center of these technological discontinuities and unfortunately often don't survive them very well. And so I thought I'd spend some time, you know, as one engineer to another, um, sharing some learnings around how to best survive proposing disruptive innovation with inside your organization. <clears throat> and um, the first thing I want to talk about is culture. Now, culture is a really powerful thing, and you don't want to get on the wrong side of it. Um, you have to put your concept in terms of something your organization understands. Yeah, avoid the variations that you're tempted to make, to, to, like to make it more interesting. You know, it could do this, it could do that. Simplify it and make it look like what it was. That first cassette I had, I could have changed the recording density on that to hold several hundred images. It would have been very easy to do. I elected to record 30 images. Why 30? Because it's between 24 and 36. It allowed people to get comfortable with this concept. If I had put a, a couple of hundred images on there, that would have been another interesting aspect of this concept. But it would have, because we had no personal computers, it would have further distanced the concept from the culture that I was in. So I think what you want to do is keep your secondary advantages in the wing and keep it on a familiar plane and just go with the essential elements of it. I, I would say do not uh, challenge your company's culture. Use it as best you can. Uh, next thing here is, is friends. I, I really do think people like innovators. They just don't like being seen with them. Um, <coughs> And I think the reason your, your, um, your private support will be greater than your public support has to do with our education. I think we, we are ingrained to think that we have to provide answers. We're paid to provide answers. We're scored on providing answers. And innovation is about generating good questions. You may not know the answers to the question, but as lofty as that sounds, people are not comfortable uh, with this stuff. Uh, even if they're good questions, they're not comfortable just having a question hang out there. Now, I had no basis for uh, arguing with the concept that they had said that consumers would not want to view their um, photos on a TV. I really didn't have an answer to that. And I, so I couldn't counter it. I found myself saying, you know, I don't know the answer to the question, but please keep listening to my idea anyway. It's uncomfortable for innovators and it's doubly uncomfortable for your friends. So you have to expect that. In public relations, <laughs> any endeavor that involves change is an exercise in public relations. And the average engineer has no background in this art and in many cases has little regard for it. Um, remember, you're, that's a mistake because you're trying to get across a message to a skeptical audience. Um, 
You have to pay attention to what they're sensitive to. Classic example of what not to do. You know how I had those meetings where I invited those people to see that camp? You know what I entitled those meetings? Filmless photography. Bad choice. <laughs> you know, given the audience, you know? Um, so you have to think about things like that. So two things here, two things about this. One, be honest about your idea's shortcomings. There'll be plenty of people that'll tell you all about why it won't work. Don't try to minimize it. Don't try to defend it. Just say, yep, it won't do that. Yep, I have that question. Yep, go ahead. Keep doing that. And then the second thing is never discount or diminish the present technology or approach that you might be displacing. There are many reasons not to do this, but the one I want to highlight to you is that if you discount the present approach, you run the risk of being the object of challenge instead of your idea. Your motivations get challenged instead of the idea of the object. And that's never a good place to be. So be wary of that. And roadblocks. I have roadblocks are temporary. It seems every organization seems to always have a natural desire to find all the reasons why a new idea won't work. I think we have built in no organizations inside of our, our, our structures. Um, and this goes for whether it's technology or organizational or financial ideas. Uh, the limitations always seem to come and get they never, never ending in terms of suggesting. So, and you have to realize that often these are informed opinions of well-meaning, highly skilled experts uh, in the field. So it's important to listen to them, okay? And it's just as important to imagine that an answer can be found, okay? Perceived roadblocks are exploded every day. I don't have time here to tell you all the reasons I had over the last 35 years why that digital camera that's in your pocket or purse right now would never exist. When faced with a roadblock you can't do anything about, just imagine that it's gone and get on with your work. Remember, you don't have to invent everything. And then I call, finally I call these the three Ps. These are the things that have to do with person, personal interrelationships. You see, the first thing anybody sees about an idea is you. How you relate as a person, your concept, determines kind of its initial reaction. So I have here patience. Remember that describing for the first time, you're going to get pushback. We often bemoan the fact that we clearly explain what this idea is, and they just don't get it. Remember, you had the luxury of thinking about this idea for months or years, and they're just getting it for the first time. It comes from being comfortable with the present state, and they're heavily invested in it. You have to expect that. So be patient with the resistance and get comfortable with the questions. It's a sure sign you're being heard. Persuasion. And engineers are not good at this as a group. You know, when we, well, we, don't, when we don't get a good re response to something, well, we just tell it to them again, this time only a little bit louder, you know? Um, <laughs> it's about listening to the other person and finding a place for the concept to support their hopes and their dreams. All right? Persuasion is about reason and emotion. Emotion, there's a, there's a word engineers really hate. <laughs> uh, let's call it imagination or intuition, okay? Um, but the early stages of an idea, you don't have enough data to use logic alone. You need to engender faith in an idea instill curiosity in the concept, and that requires you to, lead, to, to want to lead others to want to take a chance. You have to try this. This really can be fun. Oh, sorry, let me go back. I have one more here. Um, the last one was uh, persistence, and uh, <clears throat> that's a dedication to an idea about a different way of doing things, and it's an intelligent dedication, and that's the last thing you feel when you're pitching a new, a new idea intelligent because you're getting hit with questions you can't possibly answer. So it's a strange way to describe it. But I'm suggesting a dedicate, your dedication be tempered by the thoughtful consideration of these questions. No matter how clear it appears to you, uh, there are things that you haven't thought of. And that will, these things will never inevitably shape and bring your idea to new levels. And these challenges will be your first indications of where these changes will come from. So don't let the questions dilute your enthusiasm. Use them to fuel it by testing and refining your vision. So just some observations from a personal side about innovation inside of established companies. I want to end my talk, and all talks have to end with a story, so I want to tell you one. And it has to do with when I was uh, on a tour 
in 2005, I believe, I was in China, and they asked me to go over and talk about the first digital camera because there was a lot of interest in this. They have a lot of interest in history there. And uh, I was there, and uh, I was doing a lot of interviews. Um, in China, they do interviews. They bring the press in, and you sit at a table, and they ask you questions, and then the press goes out, and another one set comes in, and this goes on all day. And um, during one of the breaks, uh, I had brought with me one of the cassettes that I had taken some of the first digital pictures with me. And it was sitting there on the table. And then, as I sat between the breaks, there was this camera we were introducing at the time. It's called the EasyShare One. It was a marvelous device. It was a Wi-Fi connected camera with six megapixels. It had a, about a 256 megabytes of internal memory. It had a nice swivel uh, LCD on the back. It was really quite, quite something. And uh, we were introducing that camera. And they were sitting there, and I, I noticed they were about the same size. And uh, so I, I had a thought. And it's, it has to do with engineers. It's an old expression that engineers always uh, overestimate what they can do in five years. And they underestimate what they can do in 20. And I think I want to add to that they can't imagine what they can do in 30 years. So thank you very much.